Welcome to the COVID-19 General Awareness Training. This training has been developed by Organizational Support Services Health and Safety for delivery to TVDSB employees. After completing this training, the participant will understand the protocols developed by Organizational Support Services to reduce the risk of spread of COVID-19 throughout TVDSB sites. These protocols include the Health and Safety Guidance Document, Screening and Building Access, Response Plan and Outbreak Planning, Enhanced Cleaning, Personal Protective Equipment, Isolation Room Area, First Aid Attendant Response During COVID-19, and the Service Provider Protocols. For more information, please reference these documents on the SharePoint page. COVID-19 is a virus that was identified in 2019. The virus is being understood better each day, and the response to it from a public health perspective is changing as new information is brought forward. At this time, we understand that COVID-19 is spread primarily between people who are in close contact with each other for more than 15 minutes at a time, and when respiratory droplets are produced, such as when the person is sneezing or speaking. The virus can be transmitted when the carrier is not showing any signs or symptoms of being ill. This carrier is described as being asymptomatic. Steps to reduce the spread are important to take anytime we are interacting with others. These precautions will be described throughout this presentation. The virus can also live on surfaces and can enter the body when someone touches the contaminated surface and then their mouth, nose, or eyes. The Southwestern Public Health Unit and the Middlesex London Health Unit provide core public health principles to reduce the spread of COVID-19. These include maintaining physical distancing between others as much as possible, practicing frequent and thorough hand hygiene, wearing a mask when appropriate, screening yourself daily for signs and or symptoms of COVID-19, and staying home when you are ill. There may be times when it's appropriate to obtain a COVID-19 test and staff may be encouraged to complete one if possible exposure and or upon demonstration of signs and or symptoms of COVID-19. And lastly, frequent cleaning of services is required. The Occupational Health and Safety Act requires the employer to take every precaution reasonable in the circumstances for the protection of the worker. The precautions TVDSB has created includes written protocols specific to COVID-19, for example, exclusion, increase in cleaning measures, additional workplace inspections, just to name a few. A central repository for COVID-19 information is located on SharePoint. The board has implemented alcohol-based hand sanitizers in adult supervised areas. The Occupational Health and Safety Act requires the worker to take precautions to protect their health and safety. The OHSA requires the worker to wear the equipment protective devices or clothing required by the employer. This includes PPE required to reduce the spread of COVID-19 in the workplace. The worker is required to tell their employer or supervisor if there is missing or defective equipment or protective devices. If your COVID-19 equipment becomes damaged or defective, please speak to your supervisor as soon as possible because it is required that this PPE is to be worn at all specified times. If you are aware of a workplace hazard or violation of the Act, please report that to your administrator as soon as possible. The Health and Safety Guidance Document, Protocol 1, steered the development of the health and safety protocols which we will be discussing throughout this presentation. Although activities involving eating and drinking did not become a standalone protocol, there is some information related to the topic in the guidance document that staff need to be familiar with. Safety precautions are required when food and drink are involved to reduce the risk of transmission of COVID-19. The students will not be permitted to share common food items. They must bring their own meals and snacks. Students have been asked to bring their own drink bottle that is labeled and kept with them throughout the day. Drinking fountains will not be available, but bottle refill stations are accessible to refill the bottles if needed. All self-serving food items are not permitted in cafeterias or other locations. Multi-use utensils need to be cleaned after each use. Schools will not plan non-instructional activities that involve students preparing or serving food. The next part of the training will review screening, building access, and use, Protocol 2, and Management of Service Providers, Protocol 5. Staff and students must complete a COVID-19 self-assessment daily prior to entry to the school. The tool for staff is located in the employee portal and confirmation of the self-assessment is required prior to or upon entry to a TVDSB location. If the tool directs you not to go to school childcare, please contact your administrator's supervisor and follow their directions and the directions provided in the tool. 
The exterior doors to TBDSB buildings and site locations are to be locked. This will limit the number of people that are entering. There should be a contact number posted or another method of alerting the office that someone is requesting entry. Building access is limited to only essential visitors, volunteers, and service providers. Whenever possible, all entrants should be scheduled by appointment and tracked for COVID-19 contact tracing purposes. Every TVDSB school and location will need to have a method to effectively track entry into the building. Any visitors, service providers, etc. will need to complete the record upon entry and exit of the building. These records must be maintained in a secure location for a month. All entrants into a TVDSB location, including staff, are required to follow the signs located throughout the building. Each building will have designated routes for entering, exiting, and moving throughout the building. Follow the directional markers and cues to help remind yourself and the occupants you may be responsible for to help maximize distancing. Some areas within TVDSB buildings will be limited to the number of people that can occupy a room. This number may be reduced from the fire code occupancy number to allow for physical distancing. Locations with elevators will have signs posted to inform riders of the precautions that are to be taken while using them for transportation. If you take an elevator during the course of your regular workday, please review the signage posted at the elevator before entry. When service providers and or visitors are required, they must also wear medical surgical masks, complete the screening, and sign in and out of the building. Some service providers are exempt from wearing medical surgical masks, and a face covering, for example a cloth mask, is permitted. If they become ill during their visit, they are to leave immediately. The management of service providers protocol applies to anyone who is hosting a service provider into the building. The host is responsible for notifying the service provider of TVDSB's COVID-19 protocols 1 to 10 and any departmental COVID-19 protocols that are applicable to their visit. The host must also ensure the COVID-19 screening has been completed and that the service provider is following their industry's guidance that governs their work. Next, the training will review the Health Monitoring and Response Plan and the Isolation Room Area Protocol. These protocols provide direction for administrators, supervisors, and staff to follow if they observe someone becoming ill with COVID-19 throughout the course of the day. An isolation room area is required at each TBDSB location. This is a space where someone who is ill with COVID-19 signs and or symptoms can go to to remain isolated from the rest of the school population while awaiting for transportation. The isolation room area will have a sign to indicate its use when occupied. A staff member will stay with the ill student and attempt to maintain two meters of distance when possible. The staff member who is supervising the symptomatic student will wear personal protective equipment, including a medical surgical face mask, a face shield, gloves, and gown. If tolerated by the ill person, they should remove their face covering and wear a medical surgical mask. When a student becomes ill with COVID-19 signs or symptoms throughout the day and there is not an underlying reason, for example allergies, they are to be sent to the isolation room area away from the rest of the building's population. Send home and COVID testing should be recommended. If the person is experiencing distress due to their signs and or symptoms, do not hesitate to contact 911 immediately for medical assistance. Please refer to the Public Health Unit's decision tree to determine when the student can return to the school. If a staff member takes a student to the isolation room area, they must immediately notify their administrator supervisor. The administrator supervisor will notify the charge custodian so the room can be cleaned and disinfected, as well as any items that were used by the staff, students, and their siblings throughout the building. If a student or staff member is excluded and sent home, the other members of the cohort are not excluded from the school at this time. They should monitor for signs and symptoms and wait for direction, if any, from the public health unit. If a staff member becomes ill with COVID-19 signs or symptoms while at work, they should let their supervisor know immediately and leave work if they are able. If they cannot return home immediately, they should isolate themselves in the isolation room area. They should follow the absence reporting procedure and are encouraged to be tested for COVID-19. There are many reasons why staff may be off related to COVID-19. Please speak to your supervisor for the most up-to-date Tavares coding instructions. If the staff member tests positive for COVID-19 while in the workplace, they must complete the Employee Accident Incident Report in the Employee Portal as soon as they're able to. The administrator should code the Employee Accident Incident Report as a healthcare incident and log it as a TO6 exposure and C25 other. 
There are requirements for reporting staff members who become ill while at work to the WSIB and Ministry of Labor within specified timelines. This section will review proper hand washing techniques using soap and water and alcohol hand-based sanitizer to help prevent the transmission of COVID-19. Hand hygiene refers to hand washing or hand sanitizing to remove or kill the virus. The most effective way to wash your hands is to use soap and water for a minimum of 20 seconds. Hand washing facilities with soap are available at TVDSB and signs will be posted at these stations. Hand sanitizer is effective when your hands are not visibly soiled. Hand hygiene should be completed throughout the day, per the Public Health Agency of Canada's recommendation, as one of the primary ways to prevent the spread of COVID-19. This includes upon arrival at the school and before going home. When transitions occur throughout the day, such as moving between classrooms or between indoors and outdoors, hand washing should occur before eating and drinking or handling food, after using the washroom, coughing or sneezing, and whenever hands are visibly dirty. If cleaning was completed, hands should be washed afterwards. Hand hygiene is required before and after putting on or taking off PPE and before and after play or use of equipment. Let's watch the next two videos to review how to properly wash your hands with soap and water and how to use hand sanitizer. Wet your hands with warm water. Do not use water that is too hot or too cold as it is hard on your skin and will lead to dryness. Apply liquid or foam soap. Lather the soap and rub your hands palm to palm. In healthcare settings, bar soap should not be used for hand washing because it is easily contaminated. Rub in between and around your fingers. Rub the back of each hand with the palm of your other hand. Rub the fingertips of each hand in your opposite palm. Rub each thumb clasped in your opposite hand. After a minimum of 15 seconds, rinse your hands thoroughly under running water. Be sure that all soap is removed as soap will dry your skin. Pat your hands dry with paper towel. Rubbing with paper towels can damage your skin. Turn off water using a paper towel to avoid recontaminating your hands. Dispose of the paper towel into a waste container. Check that your hands are visibly clean. If there is obvious soiling, follow the steps for hand washing. Apply one to two pumps of product to the palms of your dry hand. Rub your hands together palm to palm. Rub in between and around your fingers. Rub the back of each hand with the palm of your other hand. Rub the fingertips of each hand in your opposite palm. Rub each thumb clasped in the opposite hand. Rub your hands until the product is dry. This will take a minimum of 15 seconds if sufficient product has been used. Let's review the steps from the videos. First, for hand soap and water, you need to wet your hands. Apply soap to your hands. Lather soap on your hands for 20 seconds, rubbing between fingers, on the back and front of your hands, around fingertips, and under your fingernails. Rinse your hands well with running water. If you're using paper towel, pat your hands dry, or if available, use a hot air blower. Turn off the taps with the paper towel if it is available. If you touch the door handle because the paper towel is not available, use an alcohol-based hand sanitizer after exiting the washroom. Alcohol-based hand sanitizers can pose danger to occupants if not used and stored correctly. Hand sanitizer is available at all TVDSB locations in adult supervised areas or in areas capable of being secured when adult supervision is not available, for example in offices or learning commons. When they are not in use, the bottles must be stored out of the reach of students, and students should be supervised when using them. 
Alcohol-based hand sanitizers are flammable, and the product should not accumulate on carpets, floors, or surfaces. They can also cause the floors to be slippery. Any spills should be cleaned up immediately. Only the minimum required product should be purchased for restock or refill, and extra should be stored in a cool, dry area away from sources of ignition or flammables, for example, mechanical rooms or tech shops. It is toxic when ingested. The safety data sheet for the hand sanitizer you're using must be reviewed. It can be found on SharePoint by doing a keyword search. Let's review the key elements found in a safety data sheet. For this example, the first aid procedures in case of accidental exposure is to move the affected person to fresh air and keep them warm. If the person is unable to safely move themselves from the area, do not attempt to rescue them as your safety is the first priority. Try to increase the ventilation to the area by opening windows or doors and call 911. If the product was ingested, do not induce vomiting. Medical attention will be required. If the clothing has come in contact with the product, remove the clothing. Consider providing a clean blanket to the person to maintain warmth and privacy. If there was eye contact with the product, remove the contact lenses, if any, and open the eyelids. Rinse the eyes for 15 minutes. If irritation persists, call 911. The safety data sheets for hand sanitizers remind us that these products are highly flammable and they must be kept away from ignition sources. We should also take measures to prevent static discharge as the spark could generate a fire. The product should not be discharged into drains or water courses. If a spill occurs, eliminate ignition sources, absorb the spilled material with a non-combustible absorbent material like a paper towel, and collect the waste in a suitable waste disposal container and seal it securely. This is another reminder to review the safety data sheet on the SharePoint website. Alcohol-based hand sanitizers can pose danger to occupants if not used and stored correctly. When they are not in use, the bottles must be stored out of the reach of students and students should be supervised when using them. Alcohol-based hand sanitizers are flammable and the product should not accumulate on carpets, floors, or surfaces. They can also cause the floors to be slippery. Any spills should be cleaned up immediately. Only the minimum amount of required product should be purchased and extra should be stored in a cool dry area away from sources of ignition. It is toxic when ingested. Personal protective equipment is designed to help protect the wearer of bodily injury or infection. As a worker, you are required to wear and or use the personal protective equipment when it is prescribed by the employer. The next slides will review the personal protective equipment that is required specifically for COVID-19. It may need to be worn in addition to other required PPE for your job. If you have any questions about how to fit the PPE around other required equipment, please speak to your supervisor for clarification and further direction. The Ministry of Education provided direction that all school staff are to be provided with medical surgical face masks and face shields. When staff are working in school settings during regular business hours, they are required at minimum to wear a medical surgical mask when other barriers are not in place, such as plexiglass. A face shield is also required when physical distancing is not practical and other controls, such as plexiglass, is not available. Face shields are required for staff who may interact with those who have mask exemptions or when they are entering multiple classrooms. Portable barriers, such as sneeze guards, may be used to provide additional protection when interacting with multiple cohorts or for specialized application, such as speech-language pathology. There may be situations when additional PPE is required. These circumstances may include staff who are responding to aggressive behavior while administering first aid, performing toileting activities, working with students with complex needs or within the special education program, or during maintenance activities that require two people to perform the task. Ensure that the PPE you are wearing is correct for the job, for example, as specified in the Management of Aggressive Behavior Safety Plan, for working at heights activities, etc., and that the additional COVID-19 PPE is worn as required for the task. The chart for COVID-19 PPE requirements by job task is provided in the Personal Protective Equipment Protocol 7. The COVID-19 virus can be spread through the mucosal membrane, such as the eyes. To prevent the spread of the virus, eye protection may be required when physical distancing cannot be maintained or when you're in an isolation room or the area with an individual with COVID-19 signs and or symptoms. This equipment is designed to prevent large droplet aerosols and splashes from coming in contact with the eyes. 
a medical surgical mask is still required while wearing a face shield. To put on a face shield, wash your hands and then grasp the face shield. Bend your head forward, hold on to the face shield with both of your hands. Expand the elastic band and place it behind your head. Rest the foam piece on your forehead. Once the face shield is on and secure, check that it covers the front and sides of your face. To remove the face shield, wash your hands. Tilt your head forward slightly and grab the strap at the temples and pull it forward over your head. This will allow the face shield to fall off from your face. Wash your hands after removing your face shield and again after cleaning it or disposing it. Face shields and goggles can be reused. To clean the face shield, perform hand hygiene. Carefully wipe the inside and then the outside of the face shield or goggles using a clean cloth saturated in dish detergent solution. Wipe the outside of the face shield or goggles with clean water to remove the residue. Allow to fully air dry or use a clean absorbent towel to dry it off. Perform hand hygiene. Medical surgical masks are required while inside TVDSB school locations. N95 respirators are not to be used for COVID-19 precautions in schools. The medical surgical masks are single use only and should be changed after four to six hours of wear, when wet or visibly soiled, after caring for a symptomatic individual or after administering first aid. The medical surgical mask protects the wearer against large droplets, splashes, or sprays of bodily fluid and it protects the other people from the wearer's respiratory emissions. The medical surgical masks provided by TVDSB are designed to meet the American Society of Testing and Material ASTM F2100 standard. Note that non-medical face coverings such as cloth face coverings are not considered PPE and are not a substitute for medical surgical masks. To safely put on a medical surgical mask, perform hand hygiene with either soap and water or an alcohol-based hand sanitizer. Place the medical surgical mask close to your face. Secure the loops over your ears. Position the medical surgical mask on your face by pulling the lower edge under the chin and the upper edge over the nose. If the nose has a flexible piece, mold it to the sides of your nose to help reduce gaps between your face and the mask. Clean your hands for 15 seconds before putting on mask and eye protection. Choose a mask of correct size and fit. It should be able to perform for the duration of the activity. Position the mask with the nose piece on top and place the loops of the mask over each ear. Stretch the mask to fit snugly under your chin. Bend the nose bar over the bridge of your nose so that the mask fits snugly over your nose and mouth. Put on goggles. This is a reminder from the video. To remove a medical surgical mask, remove your gloves, if you're wearing them. Then perform hand hygiene. Do not touch the front of the medical surgical mask. Remove it using the ear loops, being careful not to touch your eyes, nose, or mouth. Perform hand hygiene after disposing the medical surgical mask in the garbage. Medical surgical masks can be worn for a total wear time of four to six hours. As long as they are dry, not soiled and intact. To save your mask for reuse, perform hand hygiene and then remove your medical surgical mask as previously instructed and then fold the medical surgical mask in half so that it's not contacting anything during storage and place it in a clean, sealable paper bag or breathable container until you are ready to use it again later on that same day. Gloves come in a variety of styles and types. Nitrile vinyl non-latex gloves will be provided and must be worn while in the isolation room area or the first aid room area. The gloves are designed to prevent the wearer's hands from coming into contact with COVID-19 that could be found in bodily fluid. They are also required while working with hazardous products such as cleaners or disinfectants. They must also be worn to prevent contamination of various surfaces where hand hygiene supplies are not available or impractical. To put on gloves, perform hand hygiene and then put the gloves on. To remove gloves, grasp the outside edge of the glove 
near the wrist and peel off. The glove will turn inside out. With your ungloved hand, reach under the glove of the opposite hand and peel away. Avoid touching the outside surface of the glove. Discard the gloves into the waste bin and perform hand hygiene. Let's watch a short video for a demonstration. Protective clothing may also be required. This may include sleeve covers or disposable gowns. These are designed to protect the wearer's clothing from transferring microorganisms or bodily fluids. Staff are required to wear disposable gowns while providing care in the isolation room area to symptomatic COVID-19 people and while performing tasks that have the potential for bodily fluids transferring to clothing. If the gown remains uncontaminated, it can be used to provide care to multiple students within the same cohort. If you're required to wear multiple items of personal protective equipment, there is a certain order it must be placed on your body to ensure that it does not become contaminated. First, perform hand hygiene. Second, don your gown. Then, put on your medical surgical mask. Ensure that the nose band is snug around the bridge of your nose. Next, put on your eye protection. This might be your face shield or goggles. And then last, put on your gloves. Here's another chart to remind you of how to don your full PPE. Your PPE will also need to be removed in a certain order to prevent contamination and the spread of microorganisms. First remove your gloves and then remove your gown. Both of these items can be placed into a waste bin. Then perform hand hygiene. Next remove your eye protection. Set it aside as it will be washed later. Your medical surgical mask can be removed next following the steps that we watched earlier in this video. And again perform hand hygiene to wash any microorganisms that may have been transferred from your PPE to your hands. This document is from the Personal Protective Equipment Protocol 7. Discuss with your supervisor what protective devices need to be used and when, as well as specific work practices that are in place to reduce your exposure. The PPE may need to be increased to adequately protect against COVID-19, such as first aid procedures that may require the use of isolation gowns. TVDSB encourages all employees to seek medical attention if they have contact with another person's bodily fluid. For example, if a worker was bitten. Ensure that the employee accident incident report is filled out and if medical attention is sought, update abilities and wellness. This is another chart that can be found in the Personal Protective Equipment Protocol 7. Refer to this chart if there is a task where you are unsure of which equipment is required to complete the job safely. There are situations where staff may be excluded from wearing a medical surgical face mask temporarily. The medical surgical mask and face shield may be removed if physical distancing can be effectively maintained during recess, outside activities, lunch or break times, during emergencies, or for medical purposes. If there are tasks occurring outside of regular business hours, such as nighttime cleaning, if a staff member is in an area not designed for public access and is alone, for example, a private office, or if there are sufficient barriers to provided to protect the worker from close contact with a member of the public, staff, or students, for example, a plexiglass barrier. The Minister of Education stipulates face covering requirements for students. Please refer to TVDSB COVID-19 protocols and instructions from your supervisor for more information. As precautionary measure, some new chemicals have been purchased and will be used in TVDSB locations. These new chemicals include alcohol-based hand sanitizer and hydrogen peroxide-based disinfectant cleaner. For facilities purposes only and other very specific areas, additional chemicals may be used. Please check with your facilities team or your administrator. For new products to TVDSB, the SDS sheets will be linked to the Health and Safety SharePoint website and should be located in the first aid room. The Enhanced Cleaning Protocol sets out instructions for cleaning hard or non-porous surfaces. Cleaning disinfection schedules will be established for high-touch surfaces based on frequency of contact. For some surfaces, existing cleaning schedules may be sufficient. For others, they may need to be cleaned or disinfected before each new user touches them. Disinfecting refers to the use of chemicals to destroy or irreversibly inactivate all specified organisms on a surface within a set time frame. Disinfecting does not necessarily clean or remove germs from dirty surfaces. However, killing germs that remain on a surface after cleaning further reduces the risk of spreading infection. Approved disinfectants for COVID-19 must have a drug identification number, or a DIN. This number means that it has been approved for use in Canada. Custodial staff will complete the routine cleaning, including high touch points. Non-custodial staff are responsible for cleaning and disinfecting shared items, for example, some toys, markers, etc. Items that are porous, for example, stuffed animals or soft puppets, should be avoided.
This also includes before and after use of appliances in the staff room. Only approved chemicals are permitted at TVDSB. The TVDSB disinfectant of choice is ES65H, which is a hydrogen peroxide cleaner and disinfectant. This will be the primary product used for general cleaning and disinfecting either by hand or by electrostatic sprayers. This product has been approved by Health Canada for effectiveness against COVID-19. Please ensure you are familiar with the above first aid measures and what to do in case of a spill. There are no personal protective equipment required for general use of this product. Facilities personnel who use this product for extended periods of time are expected to wear the appropriate gloves. When using a disinfectant, paper towels can be used. Where applicable, microfiber cloths can be used, ensuring they follow the above instructions for use and ensuring that it is saturated with the solution. Reapply the solution as needed. When using this product, apply a visible film of solution onto the surface and allow it to sit for 10 minutes to kill any microorganisms. If the solution dries within 10 minutes, reapply. Change your cloth or paper towel daily or when they become visibly soiled. They need to be cleaned by placing them in normal laundry with liquid detergent. Non-custodial TVDSB employees are to set their cloths in the designated spot for exchange by the custodian. At no time should keyboards or other electronics be submerged in cleaners or disinfectants. Always apply the cleaner to the microfiber cloth and then apply it to the surface of the item. The first aid protocol outlines additional steps that are required to keep the first aid attendant and patient safe. Although we have a number of first aid attendants at each site, there should only be one person who takes the lead and helps the patient, entering the two meter space of the patient if required. Other trained first aid attendants or TVDSB staff bystanders can offer to provide assistance without entering the two meter space of the patient unless relief to the lead first aid attendant is needed. Roles they may assume include evacuating and supervising the rest of the class, obtaining a first aid kit and an AED, or taking notes. When providing first aid care, assess the scene. Patients at TVDSB should have been screened for COVID-19 by their parent guardian before coming to school, but it's important to don your gloves and your face covering before close contact with the patient. If the patient is able, depending on their age, the injury, severity, etc., Provide them with the first aid materials and have them apply first aid to themselves. If the patient is unable to do that and you're wearing adequate PPE, step in and provide care. As always, if you have any doubt in the patient's condition, do not hesitate to contact 911. When the situation is contained, wash your reusable face shield with soap and water, don a new medical surgical mask and face shield before returning to work. Contact the charge custodian to clean the first aid area. When possible, only one patient should be in the first aid room area at a time and the space should be cleaned between patients. Use the record for first aid room area to record the patients and staff members who access the space for contact tracing purposes. Testing of our emergency procedures remains very important and must continue. TVDSB schools and locations are required to complete emergency drills per the board's emergency policy and procedure. During these drills, please consider the below safety measures. Maintain the integrity of the cohort while maintaining face coverings and physical distancing. The evacuation of the school population does not have to occur simultaneously. General safety of all occupants takes priority over COVID-19 precautions. If procedures are changed to accommodate COVID-19 protocols, for example, wedges indoors that are not fire doors, there must be a process established to ensure the integrity of the procedure is maintained, for example, removal of those wedges during a fire alarm. Two examples of emergency drills that must be completed are high wind drills and lockdown. These must follow the emergency procedures and be scheduled one in the fall and one in the winter. Suggestions to manage these drills are to have single classrooms complete the drill one at a time, ensure face coverings and PPE is worn, ensure windows and doors are secured. Finally, a reminder, further support is available. Please contact our EFAP provider, Homewood Health, and the numbers listed or visit the SharePoint site at the attached link. This has been the COVID-19 Health and Safety General Awareness Training. Please proceed to the, visit the Health and Safety SharePoint website and review specific information applicable to your location. Should you have any questions, speak to your supervisor or contact Health and Safety to speak to your designated safety specialist.